Hello and welcome, my name is Jason Baker and I love retro gaming. In this video, I wanna show you what I've been doing for the last year. I have built what I think is the ultimate emulation drive. That's right. Imagine being able to upgrade your arcade cabinet running on a Windows PC, running on your laptop with wireless controllers and you can get the ultimate gaming experience. And so with that, I also want to announce my new channel that I'm creating called Integrum Retro. Shall we play a game? Now the goal of this new channel is to show you how I did all of this. So first, let me show you what's on this drive and how you can make it yourself. And then you'll see a series of videos in which I'm going to cover all the details on how you can build one of these. I can't tell you how to build the furniture, but I can tell you how to configure, assemble, and configure your own drive that you can use on any Windows PC. Let's go ahead and start here with the arcade category, the most popular category, 3,500 arcade games. Now, obviously there are thousands because of the different versions. What you're looking at here are custom artwork. So you can see the custom artwork makes it feel like it's in the arcade, as well as custom shaders. So these are reflective shaders. You will actually be able to look on the sides on occasion. You can see the reflections of the screen. And the shaders are important because they give that natural look and feel of a CRT. They also reduce the screen size, which can be very important when playing these games on very large screen TVs, anywhere from 35 to, to 50 inches and above, because the emulators just blow them up and they look terrible and it's pretty low quality. Now what you're seeing here is the bezel project artwork when they just pretty much have artwork on the left and right. It doesn't kind of look like you're in a custom um, arcade situation. And this is available pretty much for every single arcade game. But I, where I could find it, I, I obviously found the, the custom artwork that you can see here. The other important thing is, is the inputs, the trackballs. So I'm actually every trackball game will work. Uh, with all analog devices. So whether it be a trackball or a spinner, um, in this case with Arkanoid, it uses spinners, custom artwork, but it gives you an out of the box experience that works. A lot of people don't want to manually configure their games one by one, especially dual joystick games such as Smash TV here. With Smash TV, um, I made it so player one and player two joysticks will always work. Or if you connect the wireless, can most wireless Bluetooth will have dual analog. Those are already pre-configured for player one and player two. So if you want the two player experience, just simply switch over to the, the wireless joysticks. Otherwise, if it's just you by yourself, you can use the handheld uh, joysticks. Again, custom artwork really does bring a lot to the look and feel, but it's all about the functionality. Does it work um, when you get your hands on it? So looking at console games, 23,000 games here. Now these are all unique, that's why there's actually almost as many arcade games, but they count different revisions of it. So you can't go wrong here, say with the Atari 2600. Notice the different kinds of, of custom artwork. This is the standard console one, so if there is an artwork, you're gonna get that, that custom Atari look. Otherwise, I, I fall back to the, the bezel project at a minimum. So you can have a lot of fun kind of switching through and seeing what artwork is available. Notice I've also moved to flat screen C uh, CRT. So this is a flat screen version for the 32-bit uh, consoles. Remember like in the late 90s when they switched from the curved ones to flat screen. So Nintendo Entertainment System with its own custom artwork. Again, every single platform has its own uh, custom artwork. There's about 160 platforms at a minimum that I'm a, I probably have to run the inventory to find out. but some amazingly awful <laughs> Contra play. A ColecoVision, you can play a lot of these games just with the standard buttons. You do have to experiment because as you can see from the joysticks, uh, they were kind of a numerical keypad heavy. Every version of our, um, Asteroids you could imagine, uh, along with custom artwork. And the reflective bezels, I think, really kind of show off here uh, when you're looking at another arcade style. There are different arcade emulators. MAME covers most of them. This is the Sega Naomi which I really love this version where you feel like you're kind of squished between a couple cabinets. It's really good for um, especially the smaller, or sorry, the really large screen TVs when you kind of need to reduce that real estate, but you, you want that good quality picture quality of the game or the television set that you might've been using at home. Unfortunately, LCDs just do such a poor job of scaling up a lot of these games natively 
or some people just really don't mind. Me, I, I like it to feel as real as possible. Here we have the Intellivision, which was always limited because you had to put that little slip in over the numbers, but uh, you can still figure it out and play these games. And, uh, you know, Sega Genesis, fantastic for the wireless games. Again, one thing I don't know if I highlighted was the fact you can play with the arcade joysticks and the wireless controls at the same time. And this is on about 95% of the games. Some games you simply have to switch back and forth between one or the other. Now the, the PlayStation here, um, again, showing the PlayStation custom bezel work. Now, when we get into the PlayStation 2, we can't really do the bezels because the emulator uses a um, it uses a different version or a video driver that doesn't accommodate these shaders. So that's one of the sacrifices. But when you get into those 3D games, like with the PS2, you can upscale them. Um, I'm not able to do that in, in some of these because I'm running on a, a lower end graphics card, which doesn't really do too good of a job at upscaling. Uh, but if you do have a higher end graphics card, you can kind of really improve the uh, visual quality. But for now, at least, you know, with the different shaders, you can cycle through. I've got an 80 CRT, um, a 90s flat screen, and what I like to call the Instagram, which really just pops the colors and make everything look as beautiful as possible, even though it may not be authentic. So the Sega CD, um, especially with the CD games, I really optimize the file types so they load as quick as possible. On top of load times, which can be really slow with CDs, you can also fast forward, um, utilizing the fast forward feature of RetroArch. And when you get to the 64-bit uh, 3D games, those are really cool because they have some amazing ability to upscale where they take a lot of CPU, either a higher-end CPU and or GPU. Uh, so a lot of things are actually done with the CPU. So even a high-end graphic card may not upscale as much as actually having a better um, uh, newer generation CPU. And with that, though, you can kind of eliminate the need for shaders because you can upscale it to native you know, HD or 4K um, in some cases, especially with uh, the emulators like Dolphin that runs uh, GameCube here, or the Nintendo 64, uh, also has some pretty good upscaling capabilities. But to get around it when you're on lower end systems or just basic systems, utilizing that shaders does give you that true nostalgia. Now handhelds, obviously those never ran on individual machines, but they were handheld. So. What we've done here for the for the shaders is you can see that we've replicated the real looking image. If you were to play Game Boy normally, it's all in black and white. So with the shaders though, not only get that that green LED look, but you can also create an environment where it looks like you're playing on the actual Game Boy. So what I've done for the different shaders for the handhelds is I've created different sizes. So you can get to the original Game Boy size all the way to a full screen. Um, or and notice here with the Sony, it's going to be a widescreen version. This can be blown up to full screen, and in fact, sometimes this, you know, the, since the PlayStation or the PSP played PS1 games, sometimes it's even better on the PSP. But let's not forget the True, the Game & Watch series, and a number of the other handhelds you could pick up at garage sales. Maybe for a couple bucks you could get one game on a little device that really was animating kind of poorly, but that's what we had back in the day. And when we ran out of quarters, what do we do? We'll go play on the computer at home where we might have some games that we actually saved up to buy for. So over 24,000 computer games and try to recreate the same experience where you're in that 80s home and you can actually cycle through different kinds of monitors. So professional CRTs and uh, sometimes CRTs with uh, reflections. Notice here you'll see kind of the grayed out screen because sometimes the CRT filters weren't weren't as good. Uh, so it gives you whatever you want to recreate with that nostalgia. Now these are PC games. So this, um, in this case, these are DOS games. They, they work all out of the box. They start up immediately. There's no install. Sometimes you do get a choice of different audio drivers. But recommend you, you certainly play with a, a mouse and keyboard here. Also included are Windows 3X games. Uh, so definitely need a mouse and keyboard to play those. Some are joystick compatible, but you probably just play these on your PC. The Amiga has its own look and feel, a uh, different kind of 80s nostalgia. And also included are some of the more popular uh, first-person shooter games that actually have their own emulators. So RetroArch can play uh, Doom, uh, Wolfenstein 3D, and Quake. Again, but I had to throw in the, kind of that 80s nostalgia feel. I first started playing Doom in my computer class in high school, and uh, I networked uh, together four of our computers, and we would just simply play all day. One of my favorite categories that I spent a good number of months on was the comic books. So we're scrolling through just the list 
of, of categories of comics. But then, of course, there are different versions, different versions of Marvel Universe, different series of X-Men, Spider-Man, Spider-Woman, so on and so forth. So a lot of different subcategories even under this. But you can see it's quite extensive, over 16,000 comics um, and configured big box to utilize their new wall view because simply scrolling through a list would just be so tedious, especially when you have some series that have up to 600 comics. So being able to scroll through an entire wall of comics exported all of the cover art for every single comic book as well. Now, of course, the quality is different um, depending on how old the comic was and what the original scan was for, but you do have the ability to zoom in and um, actually it will improve the readability quality. So it really looks good even on a, on a big television set. Now, also included not just Marvel, but IDW. Uh, if you remember, like, say, G.I. Joe converted from, from Marvel to IDW, and, of course, the artwork improved over the years. Then, finally, um, you don't always want a device that you interact with. You want to have it provide some background entertainment. So I've included a pretty extensive video uh, jukebox of selections here. So as an example, just giving... Some 80s uh, videos, there's 764 in this. I'm actually going to be adding to every single one of the categories. I found a number of other additional music videos to expand upon this. I'll be making a, um, a another genre, so I'm going to be adding 60s music videos. Believe it or not, they had those. <laughs> um, as well as a, a country um, version. And a classic rock, which is kind of hard to say that some of the music I grew up with is classic rock. But a, a, a category just for that as well. But for now, it includes um, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000. We've got a kind of a party jam list, um, as well as a big hair band and pop rock list and uh, Christmas music. Also found a Halloween one, which we'll be including. And I'll show you how to make your own, you know, add your own music videos to this as well. So finally, there is also retro magazines, but kind of like the comic books, so something you'll have to explore. But for now, let's go into some further detail and show you a little bit more on how this drive works. Yes, we shall. So first, you're going to see when a lot of people make drives, all they do is they kind of just show you this artwork. But a lot of this artwork doesn't really affect the gameplay. It's beautiful to look at, and I love you know trying to gather as much as I can. But first, let's start with the organization. You have a number of different ways to organize your um, all of your different games and different items that you have on the box. So what I've done here is I've organized this first into arcade games, which is going to be everything possible that was in the arcade games, but also comic books. 16,000 comic books because a lot of arcade games you know, were inspired by comic books, a lot of today's movies and comic books. Computers, right? a lot of us were also computer gamers growing up. I've got a huge collection there, 24,000 games. Uh, consoles, so the handheld consoles, when we moved out of the arcade um, or augmented our time between home and the arcade, we used the consoles, 23,000 games there. Handhelds, 8,800 games into the various handhelds that we kind of uh, call nostalgic. And you know what? Why not throw in a jukebox? You've got this big, beautiful machine, and this machine is just running a PC, so it doesn't matter if it's running on an arcade cabinet or you take the PC out or you know, on a laptop and plug it into your home TV. Maybe you just want to kind of have something playing in the background. So I decided to include a really fun jukebox. Also, we have a category just for light gun games. So I have many games, not all of them, because there are, uh, there are some that just are a pain to configure, but um, uh, quite a few light gun games working for both the Sinden Aim Track and the Gunfire IR simultaneously. So you can run either one of those, as well as retro games. Um, I'll be adding some of the Dragon magazines for some of the RPG fans. But of course, you know, pretty much anything you see here is already included there. And then of Steam games, you know, for games that are still more modern, you may have some horsepower left over to play that, and uh, you can download and configure all your Steam games. And that's pretty much it. That's gonna be the main category that we choose, plus a favorite section. So anytime you, you select any item, whether it be a magazine, comic book, a game, and you mark it as a favorite, it's going to appear here in the favorites category. So you can kind of go here. All I have is Arkanoid right now, but we'll change that during the video. 
So first, let's go ahead and jump into what you probably want to see most, and that's arcade games. Now, the different categories here, I tried again, try to keep this as minimal as possible. First of all, if you don't care about the physical underlying system, and many of us didn't really know who made what, um, just go to all arcade games, and everything in all the categories will be right here. This like a wheel. I choose to do it by text because in this case, there are thousands of them. It's just easier to kind of go through this way because you can still scroll through and uh, look at all the different kind of artwork that you might want to see. But let's take a look at one. How about uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? So the first thing is when it comes to arcades, there um, the problem I always had is, is the default emulators blow up this tiny arcade screen to the full size and it looks terrible. You know, on camera it looks good because, I mean, the, the camera's a, a good six feet away from the screen. Um, I'm probably two and a half, two feet away from the screen because of the cabinet. So I really wanted to focus on that realism, and so I went and found a lot of custom artwork. So the custom artwork serves two purposes. One, it, it looks like you're in an arcade. I mean, look at that, you got Pac-Man, was that Junior Donkey Kong over there? Um, you, you've got that a dirty glass one, uh, dirty glass on top of this where people were messing with it. And here we are, we're, we've got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but it's also the right size. It's a beautiful size to work with. So I can go ahead and insert some coins for player one and two. And there we go. Now, the other thing is, is you can have a lot of fun with this. First, finding the right type of marquee artwork and also maybe changing the look and feel of how the machine looks, because you're not just stuck with this. See, what I've also done is I've tried to find every piece of artwork possible. So we've got our two characters here. So what I mean by that is I've created hotkeys that allow you to switch. So this is what it normally looks like, all blown up and stretched. Some people prefer that, which is why I've made it so you can actually switch back and forth. But you can also have fun discovering what kind of artwork there is. So this is bezel project artwork. So it's a different group who have developed this artwork. It's a little bit bigger, but it still looks good because it's using what's called a reflective shader. So a realistic shader, you can see the reflections here. It also keeps the proportions really nice as well. It's getting out of hand here. All right, so from the look and feel and the functionality, that's kind of fun, right? But even better is, well, I'm playing on an arcade, arcade joysticks. What if I want to play with Bluetooth? Well, about, I would say 95% of all the games on the system can be played back and forth or simultaneously with Bluetooth controllers. This is why this drive is portable. It's, you don't reconfigure your system or anything. You, you can plug this in and you can play this. And let's go ahead and just hurry up here. I can play with wireless joysticks. I'm not sure which character this is. I think this will be my player one. There we go. So, you know, no, no, all it is is um, configuring everything in the right way. And I think this is what the most important focus was. So let's go player two. There we go. All right. Here. All right. Now, the other thing to focus on when it comes to making your own drive is do all the games work? And joystick stuff is actually the easiest. What about things like trackball games? How about Arkanoid? Let's go down here to the A's, find Arkanoid. So what I've also done is, uh, especially with all the arcade games, um, most of the arcade games uh, in MAME, this is pretty easy to do in MAME, and I'll make some videos on this. Um, let's do... Where's the original Arkanoid? I guess this will do. As I've made it, so essentially what a trackball is and a spinner, they're just mouse devices. So any analog device, and you can actually map it so all analog devices will control this, which makes it super easy. So this way, when you're gonna play um, Arkanoid, or in this case, Arkanoid Returns, and here, if I'm impatient, I also have the ability to, to fast forward, which I, I don't need to, it looks like, at this case. All right, so here I have my character. Now I'm, I'm controlling this using the spinner. But it's an analog device, which means I can also control it with the trackball, 
which means I can also control it with the Bluetooth controller. But the Bluetooth controller is way too sensitive, I think. I, I would, I'd have to drill down the settings if I wanted to do that for this, right? Because it was more configured for these kind of analog devices, which give you a lot more flexibility. And that was a horrible game, wasn't it? So let's take another look at maybe a, some other analog games like Centipede, right? The, the cool thing is, is you don't need to go in and configure each individual game, which is just always such a pain. Right? Getting all the, uh, all the games installed and being able to launch them is one thing, but the, the, what everybody wants to do is they want to play the games. He is before H, right? There it is, there's Centipede. Now Centipede also has a lot of different custom artwork. And uh, again, this is kind of the fun things you do on the side, but you know, the real practicality is do the games work? And yes, you can, you can actually make 98% of the games work with all of these devices simultaneously, which is a lot of fun, really. Okay, so I can see that it's dragging here to the left and that instantly tells me that the player one looks like it was, uh, it was off a little bit. Yeah, here, so let me, actually here, I'll just show you. So yes, I can play here with the, uh, with the wireless. But let me turn it off because it seems like I'm drifting a little because of that input. So I'll just go ahead and turn off this wireless. And then you'll see here, it's refound the devices. And I can use the mouse buttons to play or even the player one buttons, right? So I think that's one of the important uh, experiences is to make sure that your inputs work. And then what if we, again, want to change that look and feel? I'm about to die, whoa. Hey, wh why did a third one come along? They, did, they just keep coming. I thought I'm only supposed to get some. And we can again change the look and feel to the original here. Kind of switch through, see what else there is. Sometimes the, the visuals are very easy to see, like what's changed. And then sometimes they're very subtle, like it might just be the, um, it might just be the tea molding. So notice here that the tea molding is no longer green, it's black, so. But it's a lot of fun, right? Okay, so what else can we show you? How about, um, how about dual joystick games, right? Th those are ones that hardly ever work out of the box. Uh, so we can go ahead and do that. Now, one of my favorite duals, there, there were actually two dual joystick games. One was Karate Champ. Um, I played that a lot at 7-Eleven uh, after school all the time. But I think the most popular one that is probably the most gratifying is, of course, Smash TV. Now this actually takes some, some manual tweaking, but once you do it once, you can make it universal. So I've actually made this so um, if I plug in this drive into any other computer, uh, it will actually work. I'm missing the M's, aren't I? J, K, L, M. Oh, well, wow, it's the only one that has an S, M. Huh, interesting. All right, so let's do some Smash TV. Now remember, Smash T if you've never seen Smash TV, you control the movement of the character with the left joystick and you fire with the right joystick. So it lets you kind of move backwards while also firing forward or a different direction. And again, custom, uh, bezel, custom artwork here. I've probably got about 450 of these custom ones. It's really kind of fun, you know, just scouring and, and getting all these configured. Um, but I, I kind of went kind of crazy with it because with a lot of main games, there were different versions. If you didn't see that, it actually said, this is Smash TV version eight. Um, you can play all the versions. I think it actually only goes from four to eight. Um, but I've actually configured the custom artwork to work with every version as well. So here I can fast forward, there we go. So here I am, I am, you'll notice here moving with the left and I can control here with the right. But again, you might ask yourself, well, what about the, uh, the wireless joysticks? You know, how do, how do we deal with that? It's not like I can use player one, or sorry, player three and four here, because you know, it's, you, uh, you'd have to manually configure this for, uh, for two player on the physical joysticks but I've also made it so you can use the wireless. So let's go ahead and start two players. We'll have to watch out for our, our buddy over here. So again, and then let's go ahead and here's our player two. He can take over. Okay, so it looks like we have to leave this room.
There we go. All right, so again, using just the wireless joystick. And what I did, especially on a lot of these games, is I went into the, um, the computer settings to make sure that blood and violence is turned on all of them because, you know, we live in the day and age when this is quite gratifying. So if these games had that, I went purposely, especially like Mortal Kombat, trying to turn on all the, all the gory settings that you can find as well. So again, let's cycle through some of the different shaders that are available. That was the original with the MAME output, it looks like. Here's the bezel project. So again, it, a little bit bigger, but you still kind of get the scan lines and look and feel. So, you know, whatever your liking is. Another thing that's really neat um, about Big Box is it makes you, or and LaunchBox, is you can go over here to additional apps and versions and notice here all the different versions you can play. Now, some games were quite different between different versions. So one of the games, for example, I used to play is called Cyberball. It was a football game with robots. And it was actually quite different from the different revisions, different plays, different characters. And so this can be a lot of fun to explore the, the history of the game as well. So again, I can fast forward through here. So I got a fast forward button to kind of make it boot up a little faster because you know, who really wants to wait? <laughs> and it's already configured for free play. We'll fast forward again, get my guy out there. There we go. Now I may not notice what's different here On this revision but you know maybe it's just because I haven't played Smash TV enough to, to kind of watch its history like I did say some of the other games but there you go right so you got trackball you've got spinners you've got dual joystick right all pre-configured ready to go and uh, I'll be making some videos and stuff on on how that's done okay all right so that's arcade we could go through thousands of arcade games uh, quite a bit of fun there obviously the other things here is you know, with big box it can also download a lot of other fun materials so for example if there was a manual uh, the manual might be the repair manual or it just might be the manual on how to play the game so again here you can kind of scroll through and you know read up whatever you want about the game a lot of fun things here you can view all the different artwork and images that might be available so here we've got kind of some box artwork Sometimes they'll actually have the arcade, the actual arcade cabinet. So you'll see that custom artwork that we were playing on. That's what the real arcade cabinet looked like. Right? So, so depending on where you want to kind of fulfill that nostalgia, you can not only play it, but you can uh, go through and enjoy many different kind of versions of the game, history and uh, artwork and videos. So some other categories that are appropriate to segregate, obviously American Laser Games is one. This is not the right video for that. Um, a Thomas Wave, some really great international fighting games. Daphne was definitely known for a lot of its, um, it was a laser disc game. So you're always kind of making a selection. Do I go right now? Do I attack right now, etc. Probably Dragon's Lair was the most popular one for that. Some light gun games, but now these are going to be specific to the light gun games um, just under the arcade because, you know, there were light gun games for Nintendo and whatnot. Different, um, now some of these are segregated because they're actually different emulators. So, so Sega Model 2 was its own beast, uh, for example. One of my favorites to play, especially with my granddaughter, was Fighting Vipers. Now this doesn't have custom artwork because it uses an emulator that's not going to support that. And also you can't swap back and forth between the controllers. See, now it's one or the other. So now notice it's, it's recognizing the Bluetooth controllers because they're turned on. Round one. Let the action begin. So that's not necessarily um, inconvenient, right? There we go, so there's player one. And then player two, he gets to whack you with the skateboard. Right? But now, if what I do, if I turn off these controllers, Now we play it. And, and I wanted to kind of go into some of the categories. See, the experience can't be created exactly the same. There are some nuances. Um, but now what I can do, notice I can play with the joysticks. All right, so. Okay, and then over here. All right. So there are a lot of tricks, a lot of learning on, on how to figure all this out. Again, I'll make some videos on this, but I'd be very curious from you, what do you want to see first? Right, there's, there's quite a bit to kind of give a more seamless 
experience interacting with the games. So now for, for Techno Parrot, there's two different categories here because the way you configure the Techno Parrot emulator is there's only one type of input. So if you want multiple like Bluetooth, like some of the others I've been showing you, I had to create two categories. Um, so it's not too bad. You know, once you have it done, I've actually created a central script where you input all your uh, devices, and then it goes out and configures all the emulators for you. So here we can play two games, uh, you know, one or the same game with, you know, both the, uh, the standard input and then with the wireless. Now this can, your experience can actually vary sometimes depending on the game because, you know, say for driving games, you know, when you're moving the joystick to the left or to the right, you're actually turning the steering wheel the entire direction, left or right. So you don't get that smooth transition and control that you would say with an analog uh, Bluetooth. I always love these um, these Japanese-based top-down shooters because they're just so visually intense. All the powers and power-ups and stuff that you can get. I mean, look at this. Just pretty incredible, right? So there's not too much difference here. So here we are, have the joystick, and then it's just as easy to kind of uh, swap over. Looks like Techno Parrot reported an error there. Whoops. And then it's just as easy to kind of go in here and then find the same game and play that with uh, Bluetooth. So now I've got my Bluetooth wireless controller. And I think this is one of the really important things I tried to focus on was the, the central capability, being able to configure all of your stuff pretty much in one place and then it gets populated um, elsewhere. That's kind of one of the keys, I think, to this drive. Okay, that's funny, an offsetting of the, the marquee. I'll have to figure out why that's the case. Hit start to skip everything and here we go, right? Now it's uh, with the Bluetooth. So different, you know, there are different things you have to be mindful of when it comes to configuring different emulators. Now, pretty much anything you do with RetroArch, RetroArch can do about 98% of all the games you'll play. And I'll show you what some of the other exceptions are here uh, going forward. All right, so let's get out of Arcade. Right? You can see Arcade, we can have a fabulous experience here for quite a long time. And uh, I guess we'll have to look in why Technopera keeps barfing on that error there. Let's just, uh, let's jump into comics. Why not, right? So. What I've done, this took a long time, is I created artwork for every single one of the individual comics. And most of these I actually had in my collections, uh, believe it or not. Um, so quite a few scrolling through here. In fact, you know what's funny? Marvel Universe was almost actually one of my most favorite comics. I remember because there was that one series here uh, where, as you can see, they all kind of blend together. The covers blended together. And if you, you put them all out, they made this really be beautiful mural, mural, I should say. Now, what's interesting though is you notice the view has changed. This is called wall view, and I've configured all the comic book collections to appear like a wall. So this way you can easily see the cover artwork versus you know, scrolling through the names, which may not, uh, may not mean as much. So once you click on this and click play, it's gonna load up a, an interactive viewer, and you can read your comic books. And there's a lot of different configs, like being able to zoom in and zoom out, so I mapped it all to the, the various buttons and whatnot. Notice here, so here I can zoom in if I want to. <laughs> it's probably a bit much. I can reset it. There we go. So, and of course I can just scroll through. And, and you'll notice that these are actual scans of the book, so sometimes they're a little blurry, right? And you, you do kind of need to, to zoom in a little bit. And it will, it actually uses image processing to try to improve the, the font quality, right? But I mean, this is great. Especially what if you have the comics and you, but you've got them sealed in a CCG uh, uh, plastic container, and, um, I don't know if you want to call it a sleeve, what do they call those? But um, you, you don't want to touch it, you don't want to open it. But So this is a great way to kind of still enjoy uh, some of the comics. Now, obviously these are the, the older ones, but there's a lot of new stuff. And, um, you know, what? one of my favorites, I think, was the um, the IDW series, because IDW did some really nice artwork for the um, 
G.I. Joe series. So if we go to G.I. Joe, remember G.I. Joe actually used to be Marvel and then IDW picked it up. So I believe that like, if you go here to G.I. Joe Cobra uh, version three, uh, here you're gonna see some incredible artwork. Because when it comes to retro, it's not just about gaming. And there's a lot of experiences that work really well under uh, Big Box and the visuals that you get here, right? So some better artwork here. And again, the same capability, kind of being able to zoom in. And there you go, you'll see how the quality got a lot nicer there, etc. Okay, so those are comic books. Six books, and uh, I don't have a whole lot of DC. I'm gonna try to add DC next. This takes a long time to actually go in with the Photoshop, extracting the logo from comics. Because surprisingly, this is not a lot of artwork that's available out there. So it's very difficult to kind of, you know, I'm not the best at it and having to try to extract these directly from images of comic books. Um, but I tell you, it's, it's a pretty darn good collection. I'm very happy with that. Next, I'm gonna jump right into handhelds. Right? A handheld is a unique category. Um, let's take a look at, uh, not Game Boy Hacked, sorry, wrong category. Let's go to the original Nintendo Game Boy. Now, what I love about the handhelds is the shaders. You see, the output of the game normally is black and white, but that's not how the Game Boy was. The Game Boy had that kind of greenish tint LED. I remember we used to play it, um, uh, we used to play head to head because you could actually tether them together and play against other people. Uh, one of these that we used to play was Tetris. Now notice this, look at this. This looks like the real original Game Boy. Uh, the same kind of pixelation. And there is Tetris. So the same experience you had as a kid, but now it's being done on a big screen TV. The other thing is with the shaders here, I don't change the shaders, I only change the size. So this is what a default looks like. This is what you know normal drives that you might get or something are configured as. So I took the time to make sure that they all look as original as possible. This is the smallest you can get and you can just simply blow it up from here. So up to a, a 7X improvement. All the way until you don't even see the borders themselves, right? So this really makes the retro gaming experience extremely fun because now you really kind of want to explore uh, what's available. Oh, by the way, forgot to tell you. Can you do this with Bluetooth? Absolutely. All of the handhelds you can do simultaneously with Bluetooth as well. And notice this is actually still turned on. Wait for that to start. And I'm playing with Bluetooth, right? So this is what makes this drive so flexible because again, it doesn't need to be connected to an arcade cabinet. Um, but it is compatible with almost every arcade cabinet on the market as a result of the way I've configured this. All right. Now let's look at some of the other handhelds just because they're beautiful, right? So that was the Nintendo Game Boy. Um, of course, there's the Game Boy Advance. I wonder if they, of course, did they have Tetris for that? I never had a Game Boy Advance. Ooh, that looked good. What was that? All right, here's a fighting game, right? Now again, the problem with these small consoles or the, the small handhelds is they look awful being blown up on a full screen. This is why you need to focus on the shader. So here is a default shader that I've created, or I didn't create, I, I configured, right? This is what it normally looks like uh, without any shaders. It's blurry, it's fuzzy, it's out of focus. It would be real annoying to play this for a long period of time. Otherwise, here you go. There's the Game Boy Advance of whatever size that you want. So you may even have a 35 inch screen. In my case, I've got a 55 and uh, you can play that again with both controllers and Bluetooth. Now, the other thing is you can play handhelds that maybe you never even had before. So let's go, we got obviously the uh, uh, Game Boy, uh, the PSP, PSP is a fun one. In fact, some of the PSP games actually look better, or sorry, the the PSP games look better than the PlayStation emulation itself because there are a lot of the same kind of games. I have no idea how to play Aces of War. <laughs> Touch that. Wow, Activate. Oh, here we go. We can get some old Atari games on here too. 
Uh, what do I want to do? Is there, no, there was no Tetris on this one. Pick something. All right, how about this Battle Brawlers? Okay. So this is more about to kind of show you the different shaders that are available on the PSP. So as you would expect, though, it was a handheld, so it's going to be in that handheld look and feel. But this time, let me just go ahead and just play with the Bluetooth controller. Because it can. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure if I can I don't think I configured the Bluetooth controllers to change the shaders. That's a long name. All right. Now see, that's kind of blurry, right? Um, it's, it's being blown up, it's kind of blurry, so let's go ahead and adjust the shader so that way our experience is gonna be a little bit better. No idea what this game is. <laughs> now loading, okay, finally we get into the game. Oh, okay, this looks like a Pokemon Brawl game, okay. All right, so in this case, again, I can switch the shader. This is what it normally looks like. Whoops, I paused it as well. Okay, so all blown up, not nearly as good. So what I can do is shrink it down to its original size, and the picture quality is amazing. This looks fantastic. All right, one more handheld I think is worth showing. Because I'd, I'd suggest you kind of uh, watch some of the other upcoming videos so we can explore all of them. And again, categories for all handhelds. If you don't know which, you, you there's 8,000 games. If you don't know which handheld the game you want to play is on, I've created a list for all of that. Uh, the Neo Geo Pocket Color, right? So, because now, of course, you can play, right, a little miniature of Metal Slug on there. It's cool, the graphics are certainly different than the Metal Slug that you would see in the arcade, but that's, that's the whole point, is to kind of see some and get a different experience. So same thing as before. Metal Slug, second mission. I can play with both the wireless controllers and the joysticks. And you know what, honestly, on a 55 inch screen, this still looks a little, I mean, it has all the recreations of the same pixelation of the original device, but I think I would like it smaller. Maybe about that. I think I like that because take a look at what it normally looks like being outputted by the emulator. Not this, that. Maybe that looks good on the camera. This is, ugh, is awful, right? But this is about the right size. Oh. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. This is the way I always wanted my arcade experience to be when it came to, you know, having such an expensive machine. That's all. And now I can take this though, and I can play this anywhere, right? Anywhere that if I have a Windows laptop, I can plug in the external drive that I have for this. And I can play these games. Okay. So that's handhelds. What should we do next after handhelds? Well, why don't we do consoles? Okay. Now, of course, here with consoles, there were a lot of consoles. And again, every single one of these consoles, every single one has custom bezel artwork. All right. Let's take a look at the Atari 2600. This is one of my favorites. And of course, you can't demo the Atari without showing one of the most popular games of all. And it was not Pac-Man. Pac-Man did not do too well on the Atari 2600. And that was Pitfall. Probably the number one game on the Atari. Well, next to Adventure and some of the originals, right? But, you know, if you take a look at the whole history, I think Pitfall really took off once it came out. Because all the consoles, every single one of the consoles run on RetroArch, 
they give you, that means I now have the ability to do this on b both the arcade sticks and the wireless controllers. Now what I've done here, when it comes to consoles, because you have um, different bezel artwork, is I've tried to create different versions. This is what it's being output from the emulator. It's super blurry, you can hardly read the Activision. You can see doubles of the ladder there. But if you switch it again, now we'll get the default Atari outline, which looks just gorgeous, right? The reflective bezels here. And it does have scan lines, okay? It just, it does. If you don't want them, obviously just switch the bezel artwork. Now what's changed here is, it's the same bezel artwork, but it's a different filter. Notice this is flat screen. So by default, what I've done is I've made it so um, the console will start with the type of television set that was popular during that era. So there weren't flat screens usually for the Ataris. That's why it has that more of that CRT curved look. But this was a flat screen look. And this is what I call the Instagram filter. So it is a CRT, but I've really made the colors pop and make it look as good as beautiful. So if you're more for authenticity or you just want the best visual looking experience, right, you can get that. Just simply cycle through the different interfaces. All right, now there could be a lot to show in consoles. So let me just briefly show you maybe one game from each one of them or not, or all the major ones. Uh, so Atari Jaguar. Or is it Jaguar? <laughs> Jaguar. Here's Defender. And so taking the time to implement the 60,000 plus custom shaders and configuration files is really what takes the longest. Defender 2000 on the Jaguar, wow. And let's go ahead and cycle through the shaders here. You'll notice there's an audio glitch as, because it, the shaders actually take a lot of CPU. This is, the Defender was always a tricky game. How do I pick them up? Don't shoot them, I guess. <laughs> All right. Don't shoot the hostage. Just because they did it in the movie Speed doesn't mean you should do it in your video games. All right, also the uh, the weird ones, the Astrocade, um, all configured. ColecoVision really doesn't do well on one of these machines um, because ColecoVision used a lot of the different numbers. It is functional though. All right, so there's a lot of different abstract systems. Um, you know, the Emerson Arcadia, the Fairchild Channel F, and, and I took the time to try to make sure that all of these actually work. So uh, like the GCE Vectrix, you may never even heard of it. Like, why would I wanna play that? Well, you know, cause it's, it's kinda cool looking. Um, it's, it's old, it's something maybe you never played and perhaps you might find something enjoyable about it. So I even took the time to work on these systems, not only making shaders, but the artwork overlays. Cause I was looking in this system particularly, you actually got a sheet with the game you put over the, the television or the monitor. Um, so that way it generated uh, these types of graphics, but then the, the overlay would kind of help you steer through what you were doing. So, uh, an early game of, uh, I think Zork was like this one, right? Uh-oh, he doesn't look good. All right, and the other advantage again is you can play with the uh, wireless controllers as well. All right, and they had no mercy on taking your life out. <laughs> Okay, so what about some of the other popular consoles? So there are obviously the Strange and Different, um, the Neo Geo CD, 
a lot like the standard arcade games. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the Nintendo 64. And why not do a Mario Brothers, right? I mean, who, you wouldn't, uh... here's a Mario Kart 64, okay? Now this one again works with both the physical and uh, wireless controllers, custom shaders as well. So if there's a bezel project artwork, uh, you'll notice that I'll just configure this with a bezel project, but of course I can switch it to the generic. And this is what the Nintendo 64 generic one looks like with the um, different shaders. Now, I believe that Nintendo 64 was more for flat screen. So let's go ahead and switch it to a flat screen look. There we go. Kind of like our Sony Trinitron. Oh, here we go, here's the gas. And I'm way behind, so let's go ahead and switch over here to the, to the wireless. And now we're gonna start catching up. Take out the princess, and away we go. All right. So that's the Nintendo 64. Okay, so let's take a look at the Nintendo Entertainment System. Gonna stick them with the Mario Bros theme. And again, the other benefit, you can play with both wireless and the physical controllers. Now, one of the things to take advantage of uh, with really any of, the, any of the emulators that run in RetroArch, which include all the main games, is the fact that you have access to the menu to actually save the current state of the game. So let's just go ahead and do something here where I use the power button, okay? So, but what I can now do is go back into the menu and I can load the previous state before I used it. So now you can kind of save where you're at in any game whatsoever, which is obviously kind of handy, right? Let's look at the Nintendo GameCube. Alright. A shot up the middle, and it's in there, base hand. The throw to second. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at a 3D game here on Nintendo GameCube. Now again, with the consoles, there's gonna be multiple choices for different types of shaders. And a lot of these old consoles sometimes just took too long, so I'm just gonna turn on the fast forward. 
and now we're ready to start the game. Let's just play ball, see what we get here. Sports baseball back with a vengeance this year, folks, and I am so happy to bring it to you. GDS All right, while it's loading, we'll fast forward it. And it's just about time for baseball, so let's go out to Arizona where John Miller and Joe Morgan are set to call the game. John? So you'll notice here that this is not, I can play with analog, but I can't choose where in the box I want to throw this. Time is 71 to three. This is swung on and a liner. Right. There we go. Now, if you want to change the shaders, you can do that. This is what the default output looks like. I don't think it's as good. You get that audio hiccup when you're switching shaders. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at some others. Now, the, the Wii U uses its own um, a different kind of emulation engine, but one of the benefits, though, of it is the fact that you can really upscale this. So this is really good for the large screen TVs. So if we take a look at, say, Mario Kart here, this visually is going to be much superior to than any of the other arcade games. We don't need those scan line based shaders because this can upscale so nicely. The difference is, is you're going to see this compiling of shaders ahead of time because in order to uh, generate a lot of these beautiful designs, it has to it has to create those shaders uh, dynamically on the fly. Now with this, you can't swap back and forth between the uh, Bluetooth and uh, the physical controllers, but you can use them as separate players. So what you'll see is sometimes there's a pause in the, in the video because it has to compile these new shaders. So it's trying to generate all these high intensity graphics on the fly, but you only have to su suffer through that one time, those one little glitches. All right, other than that though, again, you, you could decide to start with wireless or not. I configured this for uh, these particular joysticks and there we go. So I'm off and running. Look behind me. All right, then go over here to Luigi because he's like way behind. There we go. All right, so that's the Wii U. A lot of the games are, are beautiful graphics on the Wii U. Now we have the PC Engine, Sega 32, uh, Sega CD. Another thing that I've done for a lot of the CD-based games is I've compressed and converted all of these to the most optimum file format, so that way they load the fastest possible. The other advantage is not only from the fast loading process, is I can also use the fast forward function to make it even faster to start. Because if you remember back in the day, CD games just, they took a long time. All right, so now that we've initiated the startup, turn the volume down here, go ahead and hit start. And now I can fast forward. Now I think I'll probably reconfigure it so the fast forward doesn't play the audio. It's, it's all glitchy because it's going twice as fast. You can still interact with the game even though you have it on fast forward, so. Okay. So if you want to, you know, just simply acknowledge all the different items that they want from you to get started. Okay, so now with this off. Now other things here, um, it's a CD game. This is what it normally looks like. It's horrible on a 55 inch screen TV. 
which is why you definitely want to use this with shaders. So here's a, um, an 80 CRT shader followed by a 90s flat screen. So whatever you like, whatever you think is the best. You are exceeding speed. Not sure how to interface with this game. Alrighty. Hey girl. Alright, so Sega CD. And of course you can't really forget about uh, the Sega Genesis, PlayStation, Super Nintendo, Super Graphics, and Xbox of course. Quite a few to show you here. Now finally, let's go ahead and just um, show you the last two here. We've got computer. Um, there are some specific computer games that have their own emulators like Doom. Um, so here we have the Amiga. Now when it comes to the personal computers, you have a different kind of bezel artwork goal for these. Um, the, the goal here is to make it feel like you're at a computer at home. So here's a game I've never seen, uh, Badlands Pete, came out in 1990 it looks like. So here the shaders are gonna be focused on that at-home experience. So I've tried to find that custom artwork that makes you feel like you're on the computer at home. Now, you're still gonna keep the same template, but you'll notice here when I change the shaders, here's what it normally looks like without shaders. And also here's what it looks like with some of the different varieties. So notice that the backgrounds have changed. It's got the old 80s wood paneling, etc. Now some of these games do work fine with joysticks, but they, they are computers, so you do need to interact with them uh, with a keyboard on, on some occasions. So case in point, I've also included a whole set of MS-DOS games and Windows, so why don't we jump to that? So let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, MS-DOS category. Okay, so let's take a look. Here's a classic game, Phantasmagora. Right? Remember that was kind of a, supposed to be a horror game there in the, in the mid 90s. Now because this is a computer game, you're gonna wanna interact with your keyboard. So I have my keyboard handy. Some games do work with the joystick, um, but they're, it was DOS, right? So it was designed to have a keyboard and, uh, and mouse. All right, so what I do is I turn on what's called game focus. So there's an assign button on your keyboard uh, to turn that on. So what that means is all the inputs from the keyboard go directly to the emulated game, not to the emulator itself. Uh, so now I can press any key to continue and choose exactly how I'd like to experience the game. Now it does use, uh, I believe Phantasmagora being kind of a CD-ROM-ish game, I believe it does use the mouse. So I can use my touchpad mouse um, or this. Now it does give you that kind of 80s look. Um, there are different choices. Um, I should say there are different shaders for this as well. And because this is RetroArch, I can do all the same settings as before. If the game doesn't have the ability to save itself, I can actually use RetroArch by turning game focus off, going into RetroArch, and I can save the state. Oh, this core doesn't support it, okay. So because this is a DOS game, I'm gonna go ahead and use my mouse cursor, and I can now interact with this. And we'll do chapter one. Okay. So with PC games, again, I can change the shaders. This is what it looks like normally. Pretty bad. You kind of have, it's really no fun playing these on a big screen TV unless you do have the shaders. So here's the 80s bedroom look. Some of these are very subtle changes. Some of them are pretty significant. So now we're playing on a HR high professional Sony Trinitron.
and this includes kind of the original glare. You can actually see kind of a glare of a TV or of a, of a window in the background. So I've made it, you know, if you, if you want that. To me, it's a little distracting, but it actually is more to the honest experience. Now, not only do we have um, MS-DOS games, but also included uh, Scum VM. These are gonna be all the CD-ROM games, 339 of those. MS-DOS has 7,156. And there's also uh, Microsoft Windows. So Microsoft Windows games, 1,100 of those fun Windows games that we grew up with. And of course, Apple II, Atari 800, you'll see the various Commodore 128s, Amiga, Amiga CD TV, the VIC-20, uh, the European, the Dragon 3264, and uh, the Japanese MSX2 2 and 2 Plus. Right? So you can definitely get your fill of computer games as well when you're just not maybe feeling up to it. Now, just to wrap things up, let's go ahead and take a look at the Jukebox. Now, I'm going to probably have to mute some of the audio, but for Jukebox, I have Pop Rock. We've got a Party Jam mix. These are kind of mixes, um, and then they're genre-based, so 70s, 80s, 90s. 2000s and even some Christmas music. Christmas has the fewest, um, otherwise most of the other categories have anywhere from six to a thousand uh, different music videos. And here you go. So you get a, you'll get a kind of a thematic uh, theme. Christmas is gonna have this. Um, you can go ahead and just randomize it. Otherwise, if you just let it all play out, it's going to, uh, it, it'll just cycle through different ones. It doesn't do them in order, it's always random. So there you go. And uh, so if you have Christmas. And uh, let me just show you one other category. Um, let's just do, say, party jams. Right? Now, in the lower right hand corner, it'll show you exactly how much music or how many different videos are available. And this is a lot of fun, especially when you don't want a game, you just want to have something in the background. So here there's a, a 1,076 uh, different videos in this particular mix. So you're going to get all the fun music videos. Okay. All right. So pretty straightforward here. And last but not least, we have the magazines. Now they're um, configured much like the arcades are, um, but you'll notice here we've got Retro Gamer Collection, Sega Saturn, Vision, Softline. And the other one, I still need to add Dragon Magazine. I think that would be really fun. Um, I just added Mad Magazine, so I didn't extract the title. So I got all issues of Mad Magazine. Um, looks like I need to change the, the way it's laid out here. Um, but here you go, if you want to kind of relive Mad Comics number 002. All right, some of these are going to be expensive and hard to find. Um, but otherwise, you can enjoy comic books, magazines, retro console games, as well as music videos, computers, and handhelds. Okay. Well, that is just a preview of what I've done to, to put the drive together. The next set of videos is gonna show you, so I'm about stepped on my dog here. <laughs> the next set of videos is to show you how did I make all of this? So this way you can make this yourself. You can make this work with multiple controllers, configure each individual various emulators and overcome the many challenges it takes to try to build something like this yourself. Until next time, go ahead and comment uh, below what you'd like to see next.